who went to college six weeks previously. Hearing that his brother Dan was off work due to a weakness in his eyes, Evan declared that his eyes would recover immediately. And they did. Dan was to become another of the key players in the spread of revival over the next few months. Evan Roberts' prophetic words to his brother were on the verge of fulfillment. Dan, you shall see there will be a great change at Lacher in less than a fortnight. We are going to have the greatest revival Wales has ever seen. One Sunday as I sat in the chapel, I could not fix my mind upon the service, for always before my eyes I saw as in a vision the schoolroom in my own village, and there sitting in rows before me, my old companions and all the young people, and I saw myself addressing them. I shook my head impatiently and strove to drive away the vision, but it always came back. And I heard a voice in my inward ears, as plain as anything, saying, Go and speak to these people. For a long time I would not, but the pressure became greater and greater, and I could hear nothing of the sermon. Then at last I could resist no longer, and I said, Well, Lord, if it is thy will, I will go. Then instantly the vision vanished. The whole chapel became filled with light so dazzling that I could faintly see the minister in the pulpit and between him and me the glory as the light of the sun in heaven. And then you went home? No, I went to my tutor and told him all things and asked him if he believed that if it was God or the devil. And he said, the devil does not put good thoughts into the mind. I must go and obey the heavenly vision. So I went back to my own village. On Monday, October the 31st, Evan Roberts left Newcastle Emlyn for Lacher, intending to be away for a week. He would not return for five months. The service I continued until it was 12 o'clock. I said I was not satisfied with it and that we must get the blessing even if it were necessary to stay down until daybreak. I said that we would have to strive with heaven. Now we must believe that the Spirit will come, not think he will come, not hope he will come, but finally believe that he will come. After this, the Spirit said that everyone was to pray. Pray now, not confess, not sing, not give experiences, but pray and believe and want, and this is the prayer. Send the Spirit now for Jesus' sake. The people were sitting and only closed their eyes. The prayer began with me and then it went from seat to seat. Boys and girls, young men and maidens, some asking in silence, some aloud, some coldly, some with warmth, some formally, some in tears, some with difficulty, some adding to it, boys and girls, strong voices, then tender voices. Oh, wonderful. I never thought of such an effect. This will be the plan for the week. Everyone to pray individually for the Spirit. Send the Spirit now for Jesus Christ's sake. Evan Roberts' enthusiasm was unbounded and often overpowering. Meetings went on until three or four in the morning, and it wasn't long before the press got to know of the religious goings-on at Lacher. On Thursday... November the 10th, the first report appeared in the columns of the Western Mail. By Friday the 11th, the Western Mail had sent a special correspondent to cover the events in detail. A remarkable religious revival is now taking place at Lacher. For some days, a young man named Evan Roberts, a native of Lacher, but at present a student at Newcastle Emlyn, has been causing great surprise by his extraordinary orations at Mariah Chapel. Such excitement has prevailed that the road in which the chapel is situated has been lined with people from end to end. Roberts, who speaks in Welsh, opens his discourse by saying he does not know what he is going to say, but that when he is in communion with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will speak, and he will simply be the medium of his wisdom. Soon all the other newspapers followed suit, 
and consistent coverage was to continue well into 1905. This not only chronicled events, but also created a hunger for similar outpourings of the spirit throughout the Principality. Evan Roberts' progress from Lucher to the Valleys, Liverpool and North Wales, was reported and analysed. Here was the new Howell Harris. Here was a young man, sincere, enthusiastic, who spoke the language of the people. Interest in him grew from day to day. And he wasn't the only revivalist. Joseph Jenkins and his new key team made a huge impact in North Wales. R.B. Jones' preaching was the instrument of revival in Ross and Anglesey. W. W. Lewis continued to speak at conventions for the deepening of the spiritual life alongside W. S. Jones, recently moved from Penuel Chapel, Carmarthen, to the Rhondda. Many other local ministers and young people also took up the challenge to reach Wales. Still, many of the national papers couldn't get away from their fascination with Evan Roberts. One of the first press interviews was on Friday, November the 11th, to Brindley Evans, the editor of the Llanelli Mercury. It gives us a glimpse of the revivalist at this early stage. The young missioner was full of enthusiasm for his work, but there were traces in his deathly white face of severe mental strain. The long vigils of the week had evidently told on him, and more so as he had been able to sleep but little. However, there were no signs of fatigue in his conversation. He walked up and down the little room with a restlessness that told of a brain ever at work. Evans' emotional outpouring was called exhibitionism by his critics, the most public being that of the Reverend Peter Price from Dowlice, whose letter was published by the Western Mail accusing Evan Roberts of leading a phony revival. Evan himself never replied to the criticism, yet the Western Mail was full of letters for and against the young revivalist and his methods, something which many feel hurt him deeply. But deliberate exhibitionism seemed the furthest thing from his mind. He often rebuked congregations who he felt came to see a spectacle. He was nothing. People should come to worship God alone. Meaning to take away attention from himself, he would on occasion remain silent in the pulpit for over an hour. Yet the result of this unexpected behavior made him even more headlines. And there was a mysterious side. Here was a man who claimed to know what was going on in the hearts and minds of the congregation. Here was a man who could prophesy how many would be converted in the meeting. Here was a man who seemed to be a spokesman for God himself on various issues, and there was something about that face, those eyes. There were other differences in his meetings. Evan Roberts' team was made up of women, young women similar to the girls he had met in Newquay. They would be involved in singing and testifying, but it didn't stop there. Many dared to step into the male domain and pass on a message or two as well. These spiritual suffragettes played as important a part in the services as Evan himself, even interrupting his messages at times with their musical contributions. Many became well known during the next year, their pictures reproduced in the Western Mail revival postcards. Probably the most well known was Annie Davis of My Stig who with her sister and S.A. Jones from Nantamoyle joined Evan's team in mid-November. When entering the chapel, I knew there was a great power working there. My soul was moved to its depths. My tears freely flowed when the Reverend David Hughes asked me and said, Can I rubeth Annie? Sing something, Annie. With an irresistible force, I leapt from my seat and sang... Here is love, vast as the ocean. I could not finish it, as I was sobbing too much. I could not refrain from weeping throughout the meeting. After the meeting, Evan Roberts spoke to me, saying, You must come with me. I went with him, and was with him all the time that he was journeying to and fro. 
This wasn't everyone's idea of a woman's place, yet the congregation seemed to respond positively to the new feminine touch in the services. The singing wasn't limited to the soloists. Often the congregation would sing well-known hymns for hours at a time, hymns that had now taken on deeper and newer meanings in the heat of revival, helping to express the newly felt spiritual truths experienced by thousands of converts, incorporated into the meetings with the prayers of the saints, fresh, real, enthusiastic, free from the stereotypical forms of previous years. They broke all of the rules of grammar and public speaking. They also seemed to break into heaven itself. Lord, save my father. He's sure to be in the pub going after him, Lord. I know it's not a respectable place for you to go to, but will you go, Lord? Save him and bring him to the meeting. Mother is breaking her heart. Give me strength to stand against the devil. He's pulling hard on my coat, but he can pull it to pieces before I give in, and the pieces will be the trophies of my victory. Oh, Lord, if you please, when you get hold of Samuel Owen, tell him that the pubs are closed in Festiniog. He'll be pleased to know. Lord, you are driving the chariot of salvation through this place. But please, Lord, not too fast. Could you slow down a little? Remember that there are some like me who may not be able to get on in time. Thank you for Calvary. And although it's only a little mountain, it's grown bigger than the Himalayas by now, and the whole of Wales can see the summit. Hundreds responded to confess Christ. The effect of these meetings was seen and felt throughout the Principality. Churches were crowded. Prayer meetings were held, not just in the vestry, but in the pit and the steelworks. There was even a drop in alcohol consumption. Publicans were complaining that their trade was suffering due to so many turning from alcohol. Good language replaced bad language. Many of the pit ponies, accustomed only to the cursing and swearing of the miners, were unable to comprehend cleaned-up speech and as a result didn't work as well. Even sport suffered as footballers were taken up with the revival meetings and failed to turn up for matches. By the summer of 1906, Evan Roberts was burnt out emotionally and physically. The long revival meetings, the publicity and the criticism had taken their toll on the young revivalist. A much-needed rest was the only answer, and he was taken in by Mr. and Mrs. Jesse Penn Lewis at Leicester. Although Evan Roberts' public ministry came to an end, the following years were not years of idleness or retirement. Still passionate about the need for prayer, he gave himself to the spiritual work of intercession. He also wrote a number of booklets and articles, co-authored a book, The War and the Saints, and became co-editor of the Overcomer magazine. Returning to Wales in the late 1920s, he took part in a series of intense revival prayer meetings in the Lacha area, organized by one of his revival soloists. His last years were spent in Cardiff, where he died in 1951. Mourned by a nation, he was buried at his home chapel of Moriah. Three years later, a monument was erected to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the revival and its most well-known personality. Dear friend, God loves you. Therefore seek him diligently. Pray to him earnestly. Read his words constantly. Yours in the Gospel, Evan Roberts. I was much troubled in my soul and my heart by thinking over the failure of Christianity. Oh, and it seemed such a failure. Such a failure. And I prayed and prayed, but nothing seemed to give me any relief. But one night, after I had been in great distress praying about this, I went to sleep. And at one o'clock in the morning, suddenly I was waked up out of my sleep and I found myself with unspeakable joy and awe in the very presence of the Almighty God. 
At five o'clock, it seemed to me as if I had again returned to earth. Were you not dreaming? No, I was wide awake. And it was not only that morning, but every morning for three or four months. Always I enjoyed four hours of that wonderful communion with God. I cannot describe it. I felt it, and it seemed to change all my nature. And I saw things in a different light. And I knew that God was going to work in the land, and not this land only, but in all the world. After this, the Spirit said that everyone was to pray. Pray now. Not confess, not sing, not give experiences, but pray and believe and want. And this is the prayer. Send the Spirit now for Jesus' sake.